business you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker who needs stock video clips, photos, illustrations, music tracks, or sound effects, check out Pond5 for instant downloads at the best prices anywhere. Check out Pond5 at pond5.com. And for 25% off this month, use code TWIT25. Welcome to Frame Rate Episode 64. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, I'm Brian Brushwood. How you doing, Tom? I'm doing well, Brian. I had no idea Roadhouse had that many punches in it. Uh, apparently, you've never seen the movie Roadhouse because it's nothing but punching. They no, communicate- I know that, but I was like, wow, that's a lot more than I would have even expected. It's sort of like, uh, do you ever watch the, the effing short version of The Big Lebowski? Oh, yes. Yeah, because like, I knew they right. said the F word a lot on that, but I did not realize how much until you watched that. Exactly, exactly awesome. the same uh, reaction. Uh, frame Rate, of course, is the show where we see that you have a scissors in one hand and a cord in the other, and we're not going to try and stop you, but we're going to say this is a, what's going to happen to you when you do that. <laughs> we, we're like, you're on the ledge, and we're like, listen, we understand. It's cool. Yeah. Just know what you're doing. Yeah. Make sure that you're responsible. Do you like sports? Because there's no sports down there. <laughs> do you have your carabiner I, tied on? Do you have your right. Hulu subscription? Hulu Plus, do you know the difference? Okay. <laughs> uh, let's start off with the big story. This just in, the big story. Wall Street Journal has a story that says over-the-air TV is catching on again because of online video. Uh, They they did sort of an anecdotal story, but they talked to Antennas Direct in St. Louis, which I've heard of these people for a long time. And back when we were were talking about getting HD signals over the air in the early part of the 2000s, Antennas Direct name comes up quite a bit. Uh, They sold 70,000 antennas in January, and they expect to double last year's sales of about 600,000 throughout the entire year. And that was up 400,000 over 2010. So the sales there are skyrocketing. I'll tell you what, man, it's a what what a counterintuitive way to come to this. But it's like I I think it's great. And I'm excited. And part of me wants to wants to jump. And uh, what's funny is after reading this article, I thought, man, I'm going to go out and get an over the air antenna. And then I thought the hell do I want to watch on regular network television? And I couldn't think of anything. And then I just, I was like, oh, okay. I remember Makes- going to get an antenna when I first moved to San Francisco because I didn't want to pay for cable. And it was hard to find a place that, I mean, Radio Shack was about it as far yeah. as finding a place that would sell you an over-the-air antenna. But now Antennas Direct actually selling their antennas in Walmart, Best Buy, Costco. I mean, they're all over the place. Well, and what a great reversal, too, because it used to be that over-the-air antennas was always the inferior signal. And if you wanted a good quality signal, you had to go with with the cable. But now it's the reverse because over-the-air, you have much higher bandwidth. You have uncompressed, true 1080 – it's not 1080p. It's 1080i over the air, isn't it? I I, I don't want to say for sure, but I I think you may be right. But 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 you get you get the highest visual impact you can because most of these programs that we're watching in HD, like I'm watching, you know, AMC uh, Walking Dead on on my DVR. If it's if it's recorded on the DVR, that means it's been double compressed. It's been compressed once to be sent over the uh, the, the cable pipes, and that's up to the cable companies to decide how much bandwidth they want to give each individual channel. And then it's compressed again by the DVR. So it's like there's artifacts all over that. You don't have any of that when you have the true over the air cable experience. Or yeah, over the you don't have to. You don't have to. Dust the artifacts off your picture 
when you're <laughs> going over the air. Like, like, chat, room, rem games. chat room reminding me that uh, it's some, some broadcasts are 720p. It, oh, wow. You, you can yeah. choose to broadcast in 720p or 1080i, but 1080i is the, is the top level that you, that you can broadcast in. And it looks great. I mean, I, I, I get over-the-air signals in my house. The thing is, not everybody gets all the channels, right? It, it takes some serious dedication to put that antenna up in a way that's going to get you the maximum number of channels where you live. Just sticking one of those desktop antennas well, and you, isn't going to work for most people. You used to live in Austin, Texas, so you remember the days of uh, both of us lived in Austin in the mid-90s, and there really was. You got one station. It was Fox 7, and then maybe you could get KNVA 54, but it's like the, the, the couple of years I went without cable, and I remember I would have uh, friends, you know, make VHS tapes of South Park to give to me, but there was only one channel that you could get, so it's, it's pretty popular. I could get UPN, and I could get much music, which was rebroadcast by the University of Texas's, like, low-power station. I was about to say, much music wasn't that. That was a Canadian. It was station, a, yeah, it was a Canadian. But they, when when the when the community station at the U, at UT was not broadcasting local programming, they would rebroadcast much music on That's like Channel awesome. Six or something. That is awesome. Yeah, yeah. No, I I think it's great. I think it's good that there's an alternative. Like, and it's important that people realize that between cable, between antenna, between a, a full TiVo HD over the air setup. You can get everything. You can get your sports. You could get, I mean, maybe there's a couple of 24-hour news stations and a couple of smaller uh, sporting events that you have trouble getting a hold of. But outside of that, I mean, you could get everything and save yourself 100 bucks a month. Granted, not every location is able to get all of the channels, and we're hearing from every single one of them in the chat room right now. But it's, oh, not, yes. it's not that large a percentage, actually. No, know. I think it's great, though. All right, let's go to another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. This is one of those stories, actually a couple stories we put together here from the Wall Street Journal that makes me think we are really starting to see the beginning of the change of television pro pro service providers. Well, uh, and I'm going to say I'm going to say that this is a much more important change than anything else we that we've seen because and it's it's not a change of infrastructure, it's it's a movement towards uh, sustaining the viability of an alternative to the current way most people enjoy their media. What we've been saying for years is, look, the television networks need to provide us over, uh, over the internet versions of their shows, or eventually the internet is going to provide the shows. And, and people have scoffed at that because they look and they're like, well, how many good shows are there on the web? Who's going to watch YouTube shows? Who's going to, Fred's not going to replace CSI, come on. But the problem is, and what I've been saying is, eventually the internet companies are going to have the money to fund the people who make the good shows. And that is exactly what's happening. John Jurgensen and the Wall Street Journal have an article about Web TV's new lineup. Now, he's talking mostly about Brian Robbins, who you might know from Smallville. He's produced a lot of other hit uh, shows. And he is creating one of the networks that is going to be on YouTube. YouTube, we keep talking about YouTube, is funding all of these networks. He's going to have a sitcom set in a high school bathroom, a talk show modeled on The View, uh, but hosted by Twitter celebrities, a series about an outlandish teen wrestling league. These may sound like horrible concepts to you or not, I don't know, but they are the kinds of things that you see millions of dollars sunk into on broadcast and cable television. Well, uh, and they're, they're no goofier than the stuff that we get from standard media, from, the, from what we've been accustomed to. I mean, you know, a, a series that takes place in a bathroom versus a series about f football in a small town. I mean, on paper, it's like, what's the difference? It, uh, what matters is what life is breathed into them by the talented people that they're finally paying for on the, on the web. And then the, the article goes on to highlight, for an audience that probably isn't keeping up to, on this as closely as we are, things like Lily Hammer on Netflix, things like uh, Battleground on Hulu, uh, thing, you know, the whole YouTube channel uprising, uh, Yahoo's programming, which I, I, I think we give short shrift. Uh, Yahoo commissioned The Ultimate Proposal, uh, a reality show, which Yahoo says is getting 11 million total views since it premiered in October. That's, that is a solid cable number, for sure. That is a big cable number. Right. Well, and I'll tell you, actually, of the two stories, the one that I think is, is more important uh, is the one from The Verge talking about online video providers planning upfronts for ad sales, just like TV. Uh, this is the important part. And we've been saying this, or at least I have for a long time, that, that I, I don't understand why people pay so little for online ads when they, by all measures, should be superior and that they're better. They have the ability to be better targeted, even though they're not using that ability. Uh, they, they, they have a deeper penetration. It seems like these should be 
the the guys that are getting the cash. And once that changes, once advertisers start giving premium payout to uh, to content on the web, that's when you're going to see that major sea change. Yeah, if you don't know upfront, uh, to, to, to put it over simply, uh, are the idea that the networks get together in the spring, they show off what their programming is going to be for the rest of the year, and they try to sign up advertisers to commit to sponsoring shows ahead of time. It's where they make the bulk of their money, or at least that's the conventional wisdom. Wall Street Journal reporting that a new event called Digital Content New Fronts, I guess to distinguish it from Upfronts, uh, combines Google, Yahoo, Hulu, Microsoft, and AOL in an event where they can pitch the, the advertisers in the same way and try, this, try to get upfront sales. This is another important aspect of it. There are a lot of things that we kind of roll our eyes at because it looks like we're trying to do our impression of old media, but it's important that they happen. It's important that we have the trappings of awards and academies to recognize excellent in your field. And it's important that you have these uh, these get togethers where where the different players don't become so fragmented, but instead they find this common ground. They can all appeal to advertisers and grow the pie for everyone. Well, and, and there's a very practical benefit to doing this sort of thing, too. It's not just there's a good reason why the industry does upfronts. Uh, one of the criticisms of web television is that it doesn't have the capital to build a huge series like lost like CSI. It doesn't have the money to do that. And it takes a Google who has deep pockets to throw around that kind of money. But if you have committed advertisers willing to pay for over a long period of time, like you can get at these sorts of upfront meetings, then you have the capital together to sink money into new projects that you bet will pay off in the long term. Yeah, and that's uh, it's it's one of those things where uh, it is a double-edged sword. Um, being able to have these highly fractional, uh, personalized channels for you, where it's like if you're into underground donut bottle fishing, whatever that is, I just made it up. There's probably a show out there that's going to be there for you. But the problem is, is there's going to be all five of you who are into that, and then that's what's hard to get major advertisers to commit to. But now that again, the more web content becomes legitimized, the more you see known recognized talents because they don't the people who are funding these projects they don't care who's doing it they don't care what it's about all they care about is is it going to make money is it reliable in that regard and the more more talent from upstairs that we can get downstairs in a new media the better off for everyone although there's one interesting sentiment right now over twitter uh rg bradbury tweets out this is on our last story he says we can't get any over the air tv here in la salle illinois but we don't need it and there he is he's watching frame rate in his living room which i thought was pretty badass yeah well and that you know and that that's where services uh like the one in new york that we were talking about backed by barry diller come into place where it's like, oh, well, we'll deliver your local channels over the internet. It is all going to come over the internet eventually. In the long term, even those rabbit ears will go away and that spectrum will be freed up to be delivering the internet. I have a feeling. That, that, that's, we're talking 50 years down the road there. That's, 50 that's, years? No way. It's before gonna be, television it's, channels go away? Come on. That, that's going to take a long time. It, it, the legislation will begin within 10 years. That's what I'm going to say. Be the, oh, you're, the transition. you're crazy. You're crazy, man. You're crazy. Let's put aside our differences and welcome a new sponsor. These guys are awesome. This episode, of the of website. this episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Pond5, P-O-N-D-5, the world's stock media marketplace. Now, we know a lot of you folks watch the show because you're making content for the internet one way or another. And when you're making that content, you need things like photos. You need things like stock video. What about vector illustrations? Would you like that? Uh, Dude, used music tracks? Sound name, effects? Name, name anything, and I got a photo of it. Go. Pick uh, something. Really? Okay, it, seriously. You got a... It, uh, uh, bumblebees. Bumblebees? Oh, no, that's good. That's good. You uh, had Abraham Lincoln already typed in? <laughs> that's, that's what you thought I was going to say? That's well. That was just getting ready. You're just priming me. I was supposed to say Abraham Lincoln. Look at this. We got we got stock footage of bumblebees. We've got music of bumblebees. Why the bumblebees? Why the bumblebees? Yeah. Yeah. We got bumblebees all up in this business. Somewhere I'm going to find a. You can get bumblebee sound effects, uh, and they also have motion graphic templates, other creative assets, all of which you can download instantly for legal use in virtually any media production. That's the thing. You can get. Establishing shots of cities, you know, like a, a ticking time bomb or, or, or a view, a high, you know, helicopter shot of Tokyo, all that kind of stuff. And you can sell your own stuff. Pond5 Explosions. allows artists to upload pro quality content, set their own prices, and receive industry leading royalties on every sale. So Look the at this. people who are providing this get money. 
you don't have to pay, a, you know, through the nose for it, and you get quality stuff. And it's, I'll tell you what's great. It's, it's a great way to ramp up the production value for anything. If, if you're putting together a demo reel or if you just want to tell a story, ooh, that was an explosion. That was. And I love the preview system on it as well. I, I spent an hour just looking at all the awesome stuff in here. Uh, so check it out. Pond5 has a special offer for our frame rate audience. 25% off your purchase this month when you use the coupon code TWIT25. So go to Pond5, that's P-O-N-D and the numeral 5, Pond5.com, and use that offer code TWIT25, and you get 25%, 25% off any of your purchases. And the, the prices aren't that that's outrageous. It's almost a quarter, Tom. Yeah, it really is. In fact, it is a quarter. Uh, we <laughs> thank Pond5 for their support of frame rate. And now, into the slipstream. So Slipstream is all about the streaming services that provide you the things to watch on the internet, and Comcast is launching their own. Ho ho! Raises an very, eyebrow, I, I, doesn't it? I uh, look. It's it's. I mean, I could care less. You know, you know that I'm in love with Netflix. We're we're totally making out. What about Xfinity the stream. stream Picks? See, and I'll, oh, the name is so uninspiring. But look, it, th again, this is a good sign. Me Too services mean uh, hopefully they'll score their own deals and you'll be able to get more content added to the pie. It also is a good indication of how robust the market is and how much emphasis there is that this is the future here. So good, but I don't know that I'm going to be signing up for well, it. Well, no, you? you're not going to be signing up. Uh, even uh, let, Let's pretend that you lived in an area that was served by Comcast. You don't. Okay. You're in Austin, Texas. But even if That's you did, you have to already be a subscriber to Comcast. And I think if you're a triple play subscriber, you're just going to get this for free. Uh, if you're not, good. it's going to cost you $5 a month. If you're a Comcast internet subscriber and you don't subscribe to television, you can't get it. Uh, if you're not a Comcast uh, subscriber at all, you can't get it. They also uh, have an on-demand video service that is part of television that is also offered alongside this. Uh, and they have something called AnyPlay, which allows you to not play any of their on-demand video outside of your house. So allows you to not play? Yeah, you can only play it. <laughs> to not play it? You're only, you only play it while you're in your, in your house. Uh, oh, in your region, I guess. Um, so... StreamPix is like added on to things that you already have. I think this is way too confusing for people. I don't think this is a competitor to Netflix at all. I think this is at best a retention mechanism for Comcast subscribers if they're saying, yeah, maybe I'll just cut the cord. And then all of a sudden they're like, hey, StreamPix, Xfinity StreamPix, it's part of your package. Uh, people might go, oh, well, I guess I'll keep the triple play because I get the StreamPix thing. It's kind of like Netflix. Now I don't have to pay anything extra. But $5 a month extra, I don't see anyone calling up their cable company and saying, hey, you know what? I'd like to give you $5 extra a month for a thing I can only keep if I'm still a subscriber to cable. Right. Well, and I think I think you're right. I, I think uh, you said in some packages it automatically shows up for free, right? Just the top tier package, the triple play. If you have your phone, your TV, and your internet all from Comcast. God, if you're doing that, then why are you going to bother with this? I don't know. Well, you just get it, so. You know. I know, but it's like, maybe, I mean, there's so many services I have that I don't even know I have and don't even care that I have, really, you know? It's, it, it, I don't know. It's it, It'll be interesting. And I wonder if the real effect of the whole cord cutting movement is less on people actually cutting their cords, but people entertaining the idea and looking at their bill for the first time in years. Because I'll go, I'll go months and months without even paying attention to it. And then one day, like a trial offer will run out and all of a sudden I'm like, $180, what the hell? And then I'll rejigger my my plan or whatever. Now, NBC is reporting that its reruns on Netflix help boost Comcast's bottom line. Uh, broadcast unit posted a $305 million bump in licensing fees last year, primarily the result of licensing agreements for prior season and library content. Now, some of that does go to Hulu, but Netflix is one of the biggest consumers of NBC Universal back content. So Comcast probably is looking at this partly saying, you know what, we're making so much money off this stuff, off of, you know, selling it to Netflix. What if we just provided our own thing for $5? You know, it can't hurt. We already got it. And we make a few deals with ABC and the Foxes along the way. Man, $305 million sounds like a lot until you realize that is like less than 2% of total revenues. <laughs> Wait, no, even less than that. They made $55.8 billion in revenue last year. Yeah, that's a good point. And this is, this is $0.3 so, I mean, this is like nothing. This is like a half of a, per, of a third of a percent or something. So, but again, it's good news. Not gonna, I'm not going to besmirch it. Yeah, exactly. It, well, it's good news mostly for Netflix, right? Because NBC's sure. looking at this going like, 
oh, hey, that's a, that's a nice little bump for our broadcast division. So don't cancel those deals. Keep those deals right. coming. They're, they can only go up. Uh, CBS may produce new shows for Netflix. You know, we know about House of Cards. We know about Arrested Development. Uh, we talked about a rumored Netflix show last week. Uh, now, All Things D reporting that CBS, which makes 20 shows at its production facility down in L.A., uh, and they're not always for CBS. Primarily they are, but they do. I think American Idol is a CBS production right. that they make right. for Fox. Uh, CEO Les Moonves said during a company earnings call... Uh, that they may end up producing something for Netflix. They didn't say what, didn't offer any details about it, but th- it sounds like they're talking. <laughs> this is essentially like, hey, Netflix, so what else is going on? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not any kind of real announcement, but again, it, uh, it's baby steps time. He's like, you baby know what, steps. I called Reed Hastings the other day. We talked. Yeah, we, we're, we're going to golf. Yeah, we're, exactly. Does and have Hastings sandwiches. Golf? I wonder about that. Real cheese. Uh, and you know what? This is probably absolutely... All there is to it, which is they probably had a phone call, said, yeah, we'd be interested. Let's talk. Let's work out the details. And, and nobody knows whether it will actually turn out to be a deal or not at yeah. this point. It's, isn't it crazy to watch just how much not talking and not deciding is going on? There's so much. Everybody's waiting and seeing. It's like we're seeing the beginning of a giant Mexican standoff where everyone's just staring at each other like, are you going to? you going to? you going to? Oh, you said it. You sounded like you were about to. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, I wasn't. You, you were about to. Oh, no, no, no. I wasn't about to. I was just waiting to see what you... And on we should and on change on. the name of our show to Listening for the Gunplay. <laughs> Every week. Starting pistol. Go. Yeah. Uh, somebody who's dropping out of the, uh, the gunplay is Blockbuster, pulling out of TiVo. Uh, according to Zat's Not Funny, TiVo owners are being notified Blockbuster On Demand will come to an end March 31st. They've also pulled out of uh, Vizio and Western Digital Live. Actually, no, I'm sorry. Those are the only ones left that they're on of, of, the, of the expansive footprint that Blockbuster On Demand used to have. Now, they are making a deal with Samsung to be a provider of on-demand video on Samsung TVs, and that will launch in Australia, Europe, and the United States over the course of the year. Now, what is this What is this indicative of? Is, does this mean, like, are, is this a symptom of them being screwed financially in other ways, or is this a case where they, they don't feel like they can compete, or they don't have the resources, or they don't have the licensing deals? What, what, what does this mean? First, or let me correct myself. Come? I'm stumbling all over myself here. I apologize. Vizio and Western Digital did get Dear John letters. They're out. Uh, what I think this means is Dish is trying to figure out the best way to maximize profits off of a dying business. Because Dish owns Blockbuster now, or owns this part of Blockbuster. And they see Samsung as a partner that can make that business whole. And Samsung probably says, well, we want to have it exclusive. We, you know, we want to have it as a little perk. And Blockbuster still has a very good brand name in Australia, where Samsung sells a lot of TVs. So they say, you know, we'll do it Europe, U.S., and Australia. Australia will make us our money. You you pull it off some of those other services, saves you cost, we, we pay you a licensing fee. So you think this is a case of them That's consolidating their agreements so that they can have an exclusive? It with, feels with that a, way to me, yeah. I don't know that, but... Uh, but yeah, but yeah. Tom Merritt officially announces that this is what's going to happen. That's right. I, my, in my capacity as official spokesperson for Dish, Blockbuster, Samsung, and the country of Australia... <laughs> I would like to announce. Congratulations to Blockbuster. Now, there's been a lot of confusion over Netflix and their DVD subscriptions. Uh, and here's what's going on. Last week, at the end of the week, Netflix made it easier to sign up for their DVD-only subscriptions again. You can now go I, right I, to... The- I thought, I thought uh, DVDs were over with. I thought nobody loved physical media. And that's why they were going to spin off and make Quickster. Because everyone knew that streaming is where it's at, right? They didn't spin off and make Quickster, though, Brian. What yeah, they did do that was weird still- is they said they went and said, "Oh, we were wrong. DVDs are still okay. They're 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 gonna they're gonna tail off, but they're not gonna tail off as fast as we thought." And then they buried the ability to subscribe to the DVD only plan. You had to go in and subscribe. If I remember right, you had to go in and subscribe to the streaming plan and then change to the DVD only plan. You couldn't just pick the DVD only plan from the beginning. Wow. Now, when you go there, you can pick the DVD only plan from the beginning again. Um. Good. Question mark? I, think I don't know. So. I, don't, I, mean, I don't know what to say about that. It just it seems, does. Think- it does go to go back to your mockingness. It does imply that Netflix is starting to realize that the DVD part of their business maybe is a little more important than they thought. Yeah, I, I definitely got that impression. Here's my impression of Netflix. Uh, they also signed a deal with the Weinstein Company to get exclusive access 
to a large number of the catalog. Now, most of it's going to be art house films and documentaries, but a lot of people like that about Netflix. And Netflix has a, has a name as being a place to watch good documentaries. So you're going to get good documentaries, uh, including the Madonna-directed We, uh, the French World War II drama Sarah's Key, uh, Undefeated, and The Artist. Uh, this is another one of those. Not all of those were documentaries, by the way. The this Artist is, a is not a documentary. That- this is a headline that could have been like auto-generated by a computer where it's like Netflix signs deal to get less popular but good quality content. Shocker. You yeah. know, it's like it's but again, this has been their strategy from the beginning. They've been very conscious about how much money they spend. They have not overstepped their bounds and they're they they seem to be very shrewd about what content they acquire. And uh they they have they have acquired a very interesting catalog, a very quirky and for the most part good quality content. I, I don't think I've ever been disgusted with anything I've found on uh, on the whole Insta streaming catalog. Before we move out of the slipstream, I just I got to show you this cartoon, uh, Brian, because I know you haven't seen it. It's from uh, The Oatmeal. Uh, check it out. So it's a guy who wants to watch the Game of Thrones TV a, show. This, if anyone wanted to know what frame rate the comic would look like, this is it from the oatmeal. It's somebody, number one, trying to watch Game of Thrones and then going through, just scroll right on down through the whole thing here. He's trying to do the right thing, but eventually it just it just turns out that it's not physically possible to watch it any way legally. And meanwhile, it's easy as can freaking be on BitTorrent and he finds himself doing the wrong thing and hating himself, except for not really because he's too busy watching and enjoying the media in the easiest way possible and and we we've lamented this since day one on the show it kills us that the highest quality experience is is piracy and we don't want that to be the case that's why we're cheering for everyone to get their heads pulled together yeah now a few people reacted to this comic and said oh so what you're saying is if you can't get it then you should just steal it uh no and i don't think that's what the oatmeal is trying to say what the oatmeal is trying to say is look i really want to give you my money and you won't take it now, that doesn't justify stealing it in the end. In the oatmeal cartoon, the, 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 the main character does end up going to BitTorrent and, and taking it without paying for it. And, and I will admit that the artist should have the right to say, I don't want to sell my art. But on the internet, with digital copies, that is an unrealistic thing to say. Yes. If I make a chair, I can decide not to sell the chair. If I sing a song in the middle of town, I can't expect... That if it's a good song, that I can require everyone to never sing it again, even in their own homes. So I'm not trying to justify piracy. I'm saying it's unrealistic. You you need to look at the realities on the ground and say, okay, it is wrong for you to go to BitTorrent and take that without my permission. But it's also unrealistic on the company's side to say, I'm not going to give it to you in any but this way. I would go a step farther. I would say it's wrong to steal. It's stupid to pretend they won't. And that's what it boils down to. And, it's you like, know, and, I, and, and I, a lot of people say, well, then that second thing is just excusing stealing. And, and it's not. No, no, it's it's a fact. It is a fact of uh, it, don't you get it's, it's market demand. It's, it's market demand. If you fail to offer it, offer a product at a realistic price, then then it creates a black market. That's what we're experiencing in the United States and what uh, Mexico is dealing with with the current drug laws. They create a black market for market for something that there clearly is a strong demand for and everybody suffers as a result that's why you have so many deaths that's why you have so much graft and uh, and and crime i mean and and this is not good what you need to do is get an efficient market that makes everybody happy and again gets the right price for the right kind of media now in hbo's defense what they are gambling on what they're saying is if we sell these programs through itunes if we make them available through some sort of online subscription service yes we will make some money but we will not make as much money as if we don't make them available and encourage people to buy HBO. We make more money right now off of people buying HBO through their cable company. And that's, so that's and, fine. And you know the bean counters at HBO feel 100% confident that they're making the right call there. These guys are not doing it because they don't think they're going to make the most money. We can sit here and say, you know what, we think you're probably wrong in the long term, but... It's their, it's their content. They're going to make that back. Again, it is, it is theirs. And, and to be honest, maybe that's the right call. Maybe the right call is to insist that you stick to the currently existing model and that you dedicate a few million dollars to anti-piracy measures and you dedicate a, a, you know, a few million dollars to ads or whatever, shaming people who are going on BitTorrent. But here's the thing. You don't get to go all sanctimonious and say that, that you're shocked, shocked that somebody would pirate this stuff when you are creating, on purpose, the market conditions that create that black market. I tell you what, I'm shocked. I'm shocked at some of the things people pirate. 
Like, really? Why? Why did you download that? That's a horrible TV show. All right, let's move, let's move on to Tomb Tops. Tomb Tops is all about the set-top boxes that bring you the videos and put them in your mind. Well, through your eyes. Nintendo Wii is getting Hulu Plus. Nintendo Wii has been lagging behind. They have Netflix, but they don't have a lot of services that allow you to watch video, and now they're going to get the Hulu. Oh, look, How, just call excited? it what it is. Nintendo Wii's an embarrassment with its terrible standard definition display. And not and of riches. The game. Now, I'll tell you what's interesting, though, is, is the talk and the expectations. And this, uh, I, I don't even want to talk about Hulu Plus on the Wii. I'd love to just go straight into the talk about uh, what's possible with the Wii U controller for the upcoming uh, Wii U console. Let's do it. Uh, Let's go right past that's good. Good. So there's some talk. I mean, so many interesting things could happen. You know, we've talked about the the iPad is the de facto lean back component to watching television. And if you could integrate it into the control system and uh, and have rich content where it's like you're able to surf information about it, you're able to get interesting facts. Imagine some version of pop up videos with your Nintendo Wii, uh, your Wii U to where all of a sudden at different times, cool factoids pop up or some kind of bonus content or branching storytelling or something like there's so many things that, that could happen on this. This is exciting and it won't be at stupid standard definition. Yeah. And you know what? I have a feeling that this Hulu Plus deal for the Wii is just a side benefit of the talks they're doing for the Wii U. So I absolutely believe the Adweek report that the Wii U is trying to strike deals to become more of a media center. Because it, it fits into the Nintendo strategy of saying, you know what you know what the Wii is? The Wii is for the family. The Wii is yes. for the, the non-hardcore gamer. And well, what does the it, family want to do? They want to sit around and watch some wholesome television together. It does seem like a type of thing that might have come out of a meeting when you're talking about what's possible in the future with high definition content on the Wii U. And then almost embarrassedly, you're like, oh, well, I guess we better go on that date we should have already gone on. So what do you say? You want to team up on, on the Wii? And they're like, sure, whatever. Go ahead and sign the papers. Now, we got a couple of other hardware stories here that are kind of hard to wrap your head around. In fact, uh, I've got Andy Beach going to come on March 6th onto the show and explain to us QAM. And all of these other, like, tuners that allow you to get digital cable. But you can now get digital cable on your XBMC uh, via the InfiniTV4 tuner. It was just announced uh, earlier this week, and Gadget had the story, that uh, you can, you can uh, take content that is marked copy freely. Now, that's one of the things about digital cable is they, they can put this broadcast flag on it and say, nope, you can't record that, and then you can't record it no matter what. But if it is available for you to record, uh, then XBMC will now... Nope be able to record it. Wait a take. Does that mean like on my Time Warner DVR, there are programs that I can't select to, to record? Uh, yeah, well, you almost never hear of it happening anymore. When that broadcast flag was first put out, there were some, some anecdotes about TiVos not being able to record things off a of season pass because the flag was set improperly. Uh, right. I don't think they use it that much, at least not for DVRs. They may use it for things like the Infinity V4. Uh, but the Infinity TV4 is only $199, so it's not the lowest of cost. But if you're building a, a, like a myth box or a machine yourself that you're going to put XBMC on, you know, that's that's something you might want to throw in there. You know, that would be really fun. Uh, we should at some point put together a – in fact, if somebody out there wants to put together a, a build video showing us how to make one of these, that would be fun to feature that on the show sometime. Yeah, a little abs bit of absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, also, rooting your Google TV can give you Hulu back. All you have to do – <laughs> is a, a pretty complicated set of steps, but apparently they're worth it uh, because it was released by uh, Zenofex and the GTV hacker team. Uh, you just need four USB flash drives with at least 512 megabytes of space on them. That's pretty easy to find these days, actually. Uh, and then you need a PC or a Linux machine uh, to do some work in the command line, and then you can root your Google TV, roll it back to the previous version of Google TV, and enable it to watch restricted content like Hulu, NBC, CBS, etc. in the Chrome browser. Fantastic. Power to the people. I liked Don't it back when all you had to do was change the uh, browser ID, but oh well. Yeah. That's just the nature of the beast for, the, talk for these days. Yeah, let's do <laughs> Film, film, are not just the movies, but the TV shows and the web videos and the things that you watch. And more free web TV is disappearing. 
CBS has been a pioneer in free sports on the internet, providing March Madness games for absolutely free for the past several years. This year, you're still going to get some of the games for free, uh, but those who pay $3.99 one-time fee can access games on PCs, Google Android, and Apple iOS devices. So here's, here's the breakdown. CBS will stream games airing on the CBS network, that's the broadcast network, uh, live on cbssports.com for free, okay? And you'll be able to watch on PCs and Macs, but not on your tablets and smartphones. Uh, TBS, TNT, and True TV will stream the games airing on each of its network live at tbs.com, tnt.tv, and truetv.com for consumers who authenticate their respected service providers. So you have to have cable access or satellite access to watch those. And those are also only accessible on PC and Mac. And then if you want complete access uh, to your PC, your Mac, your smartphone, and your tablet with all these extra whistles and bells like interactive features, and you don't have to have a cable company subscriber, you don't have to prove that you're a subscriber to cable, uh, you pay $3.99. Clear, clear as mud, Dom. That's what, good here's, job. Here's, 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 here's the yeah. bottom. Yeah, I know. They're making it complicated, right? But essentially what it means is you can watch all the CBS stuff on TV for free. Other stuff, you're going to have to prove that you watch cable. You're not going to be able to watch any of it on mobile unless you pay three ninety nine. dollars If you pay three ninety nine, dollars you get it all. Okay. Anywhere you want. Uh, three ninety nine a month? No, nope, three ninety nine once for the tournament. The tournament lasts, you know, just around the month. Okay. Well, then that's... Uh, all right. I'm, don't, don't get me started. I mean, th there's a million things that they could do, and obviously they got smart people being paid to play the game theory. I don't want to second guess them, but just annoying. Well, you know what I think this is, is they're saying, look, we've done, the CBS is doing this the right way. They've said, look, while we've been trying to build interest in this, we've been giving it away for free. Now people love it. They understand the value of it. Let's, let's get, say, okay, we're going we're gonna to give you some for free, and then we're going to have a freemium model where you get everything for $4. And people no, are going to say, oh, I'm so addicted. $4, that's hardly anything in this and world of $4 apps. My, my frustration is not in the least that they are making this step or that they're charging for content. I think that's good. It's just the, the Byzantine nature of it all. The, oh, if you happen to have this, I, it's just very frustrating. Well, and you me. know what's funny about that? CBS is still doing it right. CBS says, if it's on our network, you get it for free. If, while it's on our network, no mobile and tablet. You want, you want mobile and tablet and the stuff not on our network? Pay three ninety nine. That's pretty fair. It's TNT, TBS. It's the other providers who are like, no, we're going to require you to register and validate and get your parking ticket and do all that other crazy stuff. But especially when you find out, like, nothing sucks worse than paying for a service and finding out that you are already entitled to it because you're a member at Lifetime Fitness Club or whatever. Yeah, you know, right. All these backdoor things. It just, it just builds in people this, this annoyance with even bothering to try to learn the rules because then they find out when they, even when they try to play by the rules, they end up, you know, going nuts. All right, uh, new trailer is out for Prometheus. That is the so good. precursor. They don't want to call it a prequel, uh, but it is definitely in the Alien universe. If you're a fan of the space jockey from Alien, apparently you're going to learn more about the space jockey. Uh, let's take a look at it. It's the space jockey. The space jockey, he's the, he's the one in Alien that they're like, where did he come from? What is he doing here? Oh, did he leave the aliens? And he's, oh, a, no. he's a mystery. You don't know anything about him. I had pre-buffered this, but apparently it forgets it. So after in 26 a while. seconds. <laughs> no, no. I'll tell, you, wait, I'll tell you what. That's how long I have to tell you how unbelievably excited I am. Uh, this is uh, Ridley Scott created the entire uh, Aliens franchise with with Alien, and then uh, and this is his big return to it. You know, and it's and of course he's so talented and so good, and and, and just think of what's possible now. With the special effects, with the directorial tools at his hands now. The script is co-written by Damon Lindelof, by the way, too. Yes. You were so wrong. I'm so sorry.
There is a lot to comb through in that trailer, by the way. I, there really is, and I love I love the use of of negative space. I mean, like uh, re, time and video and audio real estate in a trailer is so valuable. I just love that they have the gonads to just give like six seconds of silence with nothing but but analog static sounds in there, and it, everything about this is so big and so iconic. I, I could not be more excited for this movie. Now, John Carter, on the other hand, which is coming out on March 9th with Riggins from Friday Night Lights. I still Night say Lights, it's going to be good. I still the, say it's going to be a good movie. It may be good, but Walt Disney Studios, according to uh, Deadline Hollywood, is thinking of it as a write-off. Uh, yeah, uh, they're saying it could be the biggest write-off of all time. Uh, obviously, the marketing teams spend a lot of time and money of the total budget for the film a shocking amount of it goes to marketing and budgeting. And what they want to do is measure how many people know what it is and, and know what it's about. The title was originally John Carter of Mars, but uh, they were afraid that people would, would just pigeonhole it as a sci-fi film. So to appeal to more audiences, they changed the name to John Carter. But now people think like, well, who's John Carter? It's just a, it's just a blank slate that doesn't mean anything to people. And here we are weeks Mere days before the movie comes out. And for all we know, this could be the best science fiction movie any of us have ever seen. And it won't matter because nobody knows what it is. Nobody's excited for it. And they're over, what, $300 million in the hole on this thing? Invested in it? $250 million at least, yeah. In, in an unprecedented way. Uh, now, beyond having said all that, I still have high hopes for this movie. I hope it's, it's, like, it's like Serenity for me, where it's a movie that I love and I don't care how it did fi financially. Ladies, uh, Riggins from Friday Night or, or Gay Men, Riggins from Friday Night Lights with his shirt on, fighting aliens. Yeah. That's how they should be marketing this. Yeah, well, they, but they did, though, and so far it hasn't worked out so well. I guess they, they didn't market it enough, though. I really haven't seen... I've seen some trailers in front of some big-name movies, but I haven't seen much advertising on TV. It, the, the trailers I've seen have been cool, but the problem yeah. is if you look at it out of the corner of your eye, it does look kind of like Attack of the Clones. But well, Maybe uh, they can do a thing uh, like this white-on-white uh, -white algorithm McNoir, a movie that changes every time you watch it because there is a custom-generated computer program that re-edits it for every viewing. This is an incredibly cool idea. It's a, it creates like an experiential one-time viewing of it. And uh, so you've got all these clips that are meant to fill a certain type of space, as all these audio uh, moments that are meant to convey certain pieces of the story. And they're totally, they're randomized. Like, like they'll happen at the right beats, but the, but the actual flow of it will change. It's sort of a, a collage of a movie. I thought this was such an awesome idea the moment I read it. Uh, to be honest, I was I was disappointed when I actually watched it, though, because it just it just looked like um, every art house movie I didn't understand. Well, it's an experimental film, so exactly. you know what do you expect? It's going to look a little like Eraserhead, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but but having said that, I still want to give major kudos to the idea, even though maybe I just got the wrong, maybe it's not the right story for me, or or I just got a bad roll of the dice on what I'm seeing right here. But it didn't it didn't click. But I love this idea, and I think it would be fantastic to uh, see more of that. Now, uh, you've probably never thought of this idea, but what about doing a one-minute film festival? <laughs> Hold on. Is that a reference to the fact that we always do the 10-second film festival on, uh, on NSFW Yeah, but show? what if you did it? For sixty seconds. Ah, that's uh, we don't have the budget for that, Tom. We don't have the time. We'd have to we'd have to get cameras to everyone, and uh, we just it's not possible. Name one example of anything like that happening anywhere in the world. Well, uh, Mobile Film Festival France is giving French filmmakers one mobile camera and one minute to tell a story. What? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, it's kind of a cool I idea. Love, it seems I love this odd. story. Because it, uh, there's a whole wave of really interesting film festivals. So you've got the mobile film festival where everything's, you know, you get one phone and one minute to tell a story. You also have like uh, the 48-hour film festival. And there's, uh, in fact, they're actually, um, I, I'm sure they thought of the idea independently from us. But apparently there is a sequence of 10-second of film festivals out there uh, traveling around. I, I just love massive fragmentation in the way we tell stories. I think this is way exciting. All right, uh, let's move on to what we're watching. What we're watching. Is that what I'm doing something like Oh, that. sorry, uh, sorry. Yeah, so, uh, Brian, what, do you, what have you been watching? Uh, I took the family to go see The Secret World of Arietti, and uh, 
I'm going to confess something. Oh, I'm, I'm going to get in so much trouble for this. Nobody knows. Nobody knows who was even there. Uh, first of all, I took I took my my assistant John, who loves everything by Studio Ghibli, uh, crazy uh, Miyazaki fan. Uh, you know, my girls love cartoons and moving things and pretty colors, and my wife loved the story of the borrowers because mainly from the 1980s cartoon. Um, everybody loved it except me. I found it uh, frustratingly predictable, uh, agonizingly so. At, at one point, when I got a phone call in the middle of the movie, I, I put my earbud in, and then I sit there watching the movie. I forgot that I had the earbud on, and then all of a sudden I realized, oh my God, if I reach up and I click, I can listen to more Name of the Wind. And I may have reached up and clicked on an audiobook while I was in the movie, and I feel so guilty about it. But it's very, it's very beautiful. It's very beautiful. It's all those Studio Ghibli things. It's just, uh, just utterly predictable. And um, the the moment it begins, it's exactly what you expect. But if you got kids, you know, Bonnie loved the fact that it was very straightforward. There was suspense, but no shocking parts. Everything was exactly the way it should be. So good on them. Now also, I know yesterday. You didn't watch Walking Dead because you were so afraid you were going to be disappointed again that you watched another episode of Lilyhammer instead. Yeah, and I'm I'm interested in the fact that even though Lilyhammer has been released as all at once so that you could get the binging experience, I haven't gone for it. I'm watching like an episode a week and it's just right. It's like it's like uh, oh hey, I want some candy and then I, I dive in and enjoy it. So I'm only like three episodes in. How far are you? I'm still three episodes in, and it's funny because I got three episodes in and I'm like, well, there's only eight. You know, I think I think that has a lot to do with it. If there were 22, I'd, I'd be barreling. But I'm like, well, there's yeah. only eight, and it's not going away. And Eileen watched the first one and liked it. And so I'm like, oh, well, I'll wait for her to catch up. So I, I, I gave it a week for her to catch up with me, and so we can start watching it together. And are you still digging it? Yeah, well, I mean, I haven't watched it in a week now. So oh, okay. I think I'll still yeah, dig no, it. I only, I only but just I, I am looking forward to watching the next one. I only just, <clears throat> oh, hold on. Sorry, I'm just getting over being sick. Now uh, you're so I, choked up about Lilyhammer. I know it's sad. I did. I he got. A look, he's, got a look. he's so far away from home. <laughs> he doesn't understand Norwegian. Boy, I tell you, man, some of the shots are just gorgeous oh, in there. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 obviously very much shot on location. Um, did watch The Walking Dead this afternoon, though. Okay. Especially given our special guest. Uh, yeah, we will have a you, special guest interview at the end of the show. Yeah, correct. Um, I loved this week's episode. It was a breath of fresh air, and it's like. I was right teetering at the brink of frustration and just nothing was happening. But I loved the heavy focus on the theme that it's not the dead you should be worried about. It's the other living that you should be worried about. And I'm glad certain things are finally coming to a head that, uh, that have taken too long to simmer. Right well, now. you know what? It's funny. is I didn't dislike the last episode. And you did. Oh, I, you very well, much I, disliked it. I, 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 I wasn't raving about it, but I, I was fine with it. And so this episode, I just liked I didn't, I, I, I kind of, the needle didn't move very far for me. I, I thought it was a good episode, but it seems like you're like, you're doing a little manic depressive with The Walking Dead. You know, I you're am, bouncing I all am. over it's, the place. It, it means so much to me, and I've invested so much in the comic, and I've just loved this brand for, for half a decade now that it really, like, I, I want it to be good. And when it's not, Freaking amazing! I just get depressed, and then when it when it is amazing, I'm manic again about it. So there were a few I, I bad lines I felt like, and and not even badly written so much as either badly delivered or maybe edited in at a bad pace. But there were a few clunkers in there. But overall, I I thought the story moved ahead really well, and I like where it's going, and I like that we got to a place. The only part that and you know spoiler alert, yellow here, I didn't understand why Rick spoke up in the bar. I did not see that fitting into his character. I didn't see the motivation for it. And what he said just sounded weird to me. <sighs> yeah, yeah I, actually, I, I did, like, uh, it, Rick in the television show has been uh, persistently doing the right thing, whether it was smart or not. And at that moment, you know, while I was training as a cop, says you don't kill people and then hide and shoot people in the back, you know, he, he wants to believe that they can own this and still walk away and, uh, you know, not but he just it, showed that he'll do what's necessary. I felt like what was necessary there was being quiet. Yeah. Let him go away. No, no. I don't know. That's what that's what would have been smart. I mean, that's certainly Shane would agree with you. But again, I, I think that's the problem with keeping Shane around. No, Shane wouldn't. Shane would have like stepped up and tried to shoot them all. 
Right. No, correct. But but again, like uh, keeping Shane on the show makes it to where you got to you keep having to push Rick into a, a a place his character wasn't in the comic books. You know, everyone has their own space, moral space that they occupy. And when one niche is already filled, it forces, you know, another niche to go almost cartoonishly the too far in another way. And I think that's just a symptom of, you know, like we can't have Rick acting like Shane because, Shane, you know, he's not Shane. He's Rick. Yeah, I know. No, that's a good point. I just I just felt like it was inconsistent. Uh, I finished watching Star Trek, the original series on Netflix, all the way, all 77 episodes of it. And one thing, I, I've never done this. I've never watched them all in production order before. One thing I really realized over the course of it is how much better the show gets over the oh, course of gosh. three seasons. Yeah, you're talking about, uh, sorry, I, I was looking at something else. You're talking about uh, Next Generation or which one? Star Trek, the original series. Oh, the original series. Same thing oh. I've been talking about for the past four weeks, Brian. I, I know you don't well, really listen the, the, to what I say. I get mixed right? up because I've been talking about the next generation, and one of the emails that we're going to talk about in the feedback is about the, the how to bring new people to the next generation. So that's where my head's at right now. <laughs> no, I've been watching the original series, uh, all, all the first three seasons, 77 so episodes. And uh, I, I just... I, I always know the next generation gets better over the seven seasons. And Deep Space Nine Voyager, that's, it's, it's pretty like... It's almost like a trope to say, like, yep, first season sucks, second season unstable, third season they get their legs, and it's great from there on. And right. it's actually true of the original series as well. Not that they don't have some great episodes in those first two seasons, but you can see why there was so much anguish when it got canceled, because they were just getting their legs. They were starting to tell some amazing stories. They had figured out the interplay of the characters. And I had never realized that watching them all out of order before... Because I just thought of the original series as being like, oh, you yeah, know, they got some good episodes, they got some bad episodes. So that's kind of something cool that I probably wouldn't have done if it weren't for Netflix. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm glad you had that experience. I also started watching The New Voyages, uh, Star Trek The New Voyages. Not Voyager. Not Voyager. No. You're talking about the fan created. Yeah, New it's, it's fan created, but they also have the cooperation of CBS for using the, the properties and many of the former stars. Uh, in fact, the guy. Uh, the, in episode one that I'm rewatching, I'd, I'd watched, you know, it's like six years old at this point. Uh, they have one of the the guy who played Decker in the Doomsday Machine play Decker in the That's future. Awesome. Uh, That's and, awesome. And they go on, they get Nichelle Nichols, they get Walter Koenig, they get George Takei. I mean, they, you know, they're doing it for love. Uh, and they just came out with a trailer a couple weeks ago for their newest episode. So go check it out. Star Trek New Voyages. Just do a search for it. Uh, the first episode's a little shaky because they were just getting started, but the production values are amazing. Their graphics, awesome. uh, their set, all of that is really impressive. Uh, and they are one of the earliest people that made me go, you know what? Web video can, can totally do it. If they get the right talent, the right backing, I'll, I'll watch this stuff. I won't need anything else. Yeah, what an awesome, bizarro world where a fan-made creation, you know, 40 years after the cancellation of a series can look better than the series itself. With, um, you know, yeah, almost. Line, everything. Now it's time for feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Frame Rate. Oh, yeah. Christopher in Portland, Oregon says, Dear Brian or Tom, if you're being nosy, I guess you should read this. Okay, yeah, it says, a few weeks back, you were talking about getting one of your daughters interested in Star Trek The Next Generation. I have two young boys myself, and then entertaining the prospect of introducing them to the world of Star Trek later in life. Like yourself, I believe the first season of Star Trek The Next Generation was pretty bad, and most actors from the show agree it was a minor miracle that it made it to a second season. But I've come up with a hard quandary. Because Denise Crosby, a.k.a. Tasha, Tasha Yar, Spoiler alert. Uh, dies does really <laughs> spoiler alert nothing <laughs> die so early in the first season did she die in the first season i thought she at least lasted to the second nope wow i feel my kids should at least watch skin of evil so that they know what happens to her and why it's significant when she appears in the future episodes like yesterday's enterprise but the problem with that is because they will not have not seen any earlier episodes they don't have any emotional attachment to her character so watching her die would be like seeing any other red shirt die on any other episode thoughts thanks for your time first of all um don't, don't even bother you're not going to create that moment was for you and for your context and for your background and it will be precious and there's no way for you to create that in in the kids well, there also, is, but there, it's such a hard uphill struggle to make them stick around through that first season to build that up and to have the kind of excitement. The reason I feel like it made it to a second season is so many people like me and my dad were so excited for the next generation that we forgave yep. a lot. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's and that's the thing. And, and you got to realize, like, your experience was you put up with how bad that first season was because you had so much love for the original series. Your kids have none of that. Your kids are into other things. If you want them to appreciate it, you got to give them the cream of the crop. And, and they're not going to dive in very likely and, and get into all the other stuff. And that's okay because there's going to be plenty of other things that you're going to share that will be new to both of you. He also wants to know how, how to explain the, why Dr. Crusher leaves for a year. Uh, explain contract renegotiations. It's like, so what? It's like, eh, don't worry about it. She wanted to move on. She wanted to try new things. She yeah. did. Didn't work it out. It didn't work out. She came back. When she came back. Uh, thanks, Anthony uh, writes in. Th oh, th thanks, Anthony, for the last thing here. That's <laughs> oh, not his thanks, name. Anthony. Maybe his first name's Thanks. Last name's Anthony. I don't know. <laughs> However, he wrote in and said, hey, Brian and Tom, I would like to add this to your ethical debate. Is it ethical for me to get a TV show or movie from illegal means if I run out of time to finish the movie from a renting service? From time to time, I run out of time to watch a movie from iTunes or Amazon because the rental period is up, which is so stupid. Would it be ethical to pirate the content I paid for if I only watch it once? I'm, I'm going to say not, no. not ethical. I mean, that's that's it's certainly not legal. You admit that it's not ethical yeah. because you are making a choice for the creator. The creator says, "I only want to allow you to have this for 24 hours." Okay, it, wait, it, it, here, here's my here's my analogy. You, right? you need a distinction. You need a distinction. You're saying the creator, but it's not the creator. It's the owner. The creator very likely would just shout. I mean God, God Brian. Content. What's that? I said I mean God. Okay, <laughs> the creator. No, right. you're right. No, I, I shouldn't use that. Uh, that's that's the weird part about the, the rights ethical. holder. Who is the person who has the right to it? And and we can get into debate about how rights get assigned. But in the eyes of you know to make the debate worth having and not just right. trail off, the rights holder is the person who gets to tell you what to do with their work of creation. And and I said creator because it's based on the idea that if I create something, I should have the right to control how it's used. Uh, and and you could debate that as well. But given all of that. Uh, they're saying, you know what, you can you can have it for 24 hours. And I was going to say the analogy for me would be if you checked a book out of the library and they said, well, you know, you have to you have to bring it back because your loan period is over and there's no renewals. And then you sneak into the library and steal the book so you can finish reading it. Or or no, I'd say it's more like you snuck the book back in three days later and you didn't pay an overdue fee. And then you're like, well, hey, man, it's back in the library. Well, then That's you're just in debt. I'm not taking anyone. That's yeah. not the because you haven't you haven't taken it again. You've just yeah, that's just true. Yeah, whatever. Stiffed them on a it, fine. Metaphors are hard. Uh, all right, from Scott Morrison, we got he he sent us a gigantic long letter. Said a lot of nice things about the show. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, but then he gets says, okay, now for the juicy part. My wife and I own a kids physical fitness company in Joppa, Maryland, MD. That's Maryland, right? KineticYouthAcademy.com, a small production company, just rented a large building not six hundred yards. From our front door, same landlord. Their name, Night, Tale, Night Takes King Production. Uh, this is the production group behind House of Cards. They're going to be filming there. This explains the nice gentleman who stopped by our place and asked about regional sounds. And if we heard a lot of outside noise inside our building. I haven't made contact yet as the construction crews are renovating the space, but I'll keep you posted. Sorry this short note ended up so long. Take care. Feel free to call if you want more details. Uh, Scott Morrison. This is a uh, this is an interesting opportunity we have that we we can maybe send someone on a recon mission or something. Like, I, we, we, what do we? This is too awesome a thing to. <laughs> we get okay. We get Scott to do a video blog, do some recon, send us some links, and then we have Dana Brunetti back on the show. There you go. And we yeah, confront him with the evidence, great. and you know what he does? He goes, "Yeah, I know. I'm involved in the production." No, and, he, and he's like, he's like, uh, it's kind of creepy that you guys are spying yeah, on me, really. Exactly. Why, don't, why don't you just have uh, me on the show? I it's, mean, I, some of that stuff's, you know, implying the wrong thing. No, I will say, send us anything you got over there, and and like set up a spy cam, like wear a jaunty hat with the with a car with the camera on top, and be like, hello, sir. I understand you're doing a film, and then like see what stars you can see. We'll, we'll go total TMZ on this. Yeah, well, you know what? Be, here's the the real thing: is be nice. Be cooperative, talk to the folks, offer to help them out where you think you have something you can help them out with, and you'll probably get some access that you wouldn't get otherwise. Because they'll be like, oh, you know, let's keep the, whole, the locals happy. That's cool that it's so near to you. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, we got a uh, special interview that we're going to tack on to the end of this frame rate because we have to wait a few minutes to dial it up and get it going. But those of you either listening to the audio podcast or watching on video will get it immediately. And those of you Hold watching on, let me live, cast a spell. Just hang I'm going to do a spell of summoning. Get ready, get ready. And... Here he is. That was amazing, Brian Brushwood. The powers of summoning worked, and we have 
the man responsible for The Walking Dead, Robert Kirkman here. Hello. Thank you for joining us, Robert. Oh, well, you know, thanks for having me. May I call you Robert? <laughs> yes, no. I would, pr I would hey, prefer no. you call me Robert. <laughs> All right, good. Hey, so uh, I, I, can I just jump right in here? I'm, I'm going to just run it right out of the gate like a mad, rabid dog. Uh, you have walked one of the most difficult lines that is, is possible to satisfy hardcore comic book fans and translate that momentum into an incredibly successful online or television property and yet tend to make just about everybody happy. How much of that do you feel like... <clears throat> Was 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 uh, you know part of a master strategy in your mind? How much do you think was a total stroke of luck? And and how how did you? What was your attitude going into it to make that happen? Well, first of all, I'll say uh, spend a little more time on the internet, and uh, you'll find some uh, you'll find some people complaining, uh, which is what I spend most of my time doing. But uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, it's kind of a lucky thing. I know that uh, you know genre audiences, people that really like comics and stuff like that, are are very particular about you know adaptations and comic book movies and comic book TV shows, and so like we always knew going into it that you know uh, it, it would be very difficult to you know make everyone happy, and I think that you know, just everyone on the show uh, uh, cares about the comic. I mean, I'm constantly surprised at, you know, how many people from the people that work in post to the people that, you know, uh, work on the set, uh, uh, you know, doing boom mics and whatever it is that uh, that uh, people do uh, in the crew. Uh, they all read the comic and they all really love the comic. And I think that, you know, because every single person at every single level uh, on the show, you know, does believe in the material and, and actually does like it, I think it seeps through i think it can't help but seep through so i think it's kind of a neat thing now brian uh, brian's being a little modest here uh he is one of the people on the internet that you're talking about <laughs> uh, in fact i don't know how much they told you about our show but one of the things we do is we talk about you know watching geeky stuff and we talk about the walking dead a lot in fact we we, we we give our opinions on it uh and and one of the things that that you mentioned earlier on in an interview i as a snippet of a quote that i, I would like to hear more about is when you said hey this is kind of fun because I get to do what ifs. I get to get a do over. Uh, is is that true? Are you looking at this as like, hey, you know, let's tell the story in a different way? And how how much of that is shaping how the show plays out versus the comic book? Well, I mean, look, like most writers, I live off of self-loathing, and so I'm not one of those guys that's like, oh, The Walking Dead is, you know, this this great thing. You know, I, I, I look at it, and all I see is its flaws. So to be able to go back into that material and, you know, uh, beef some things up, change things that I didn't really uh, uh, think worked out well, and also to kind of go, oh, that really worked. Let's do more of that and expand certain things that I think are cool, uh, you know, is it, kind of good. I like getting in there and, uh, you know, tinkering with things and, you uh, uh, you know, uh, I think they think they call it adapting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly adapted. In fact, no. Curtis, Curtis B in our chat room wants to know if you thought about it as a TV show or movie when you were originally writing it at all. How much how much that played into your creation of it? I mean, look, as a as a fan of zombie fiction and zombie films and stuff, I think the main genesis of The Walking Dead was like, oh, my gosh, wouldn't that be a cool TV show? As a fan, I would love to watch that TV show. And, uh, you know, I don't do television. I did comics at the time. And so instead I did it as a comic. So, uh, you know, I never really thought that, you know, doing the comic, I never really thought like, oh, this is definitely going to be a TV show one day. It's just perfect for that. I, I never thought in a million years that any network would be crazy enough to try and do zombies on TV. But uh, I always did think, like, as a fan, it would be a cool show. So uh, from the chat room, Patrick Delahanty asks, and I think this is a good question, will any of the TV-only characters like Merle Dixon show up eventually in the comics? Do you have any plans to do something like that? Uh, well, you know, I can't, uh, I can't really say... Uh, uh, if something like that were to happen, I would want it to be a surprise. But uh, we did just send out some teaser images promoting an upcoming storyline uh, in the comic books called uh, Something to Fear, and it was a group of shot, or it was a it was a group of shots of all these different people where. Uh, carrying threatening weapons and one of them was carrying a crossbow. So uh, uh, you know, take from that what you will. Awesome. That is awesome. Uh, so it, it seemed like there were certain cues that you guys gave. Uh, obviously, at this point. The, the television show has diverged very substantially from the comic book. Certain characters are dead. Other characters are alive that, that shouldn't be necessarily, or I, don't, I say shouldn't be, whatever. But, uh, but it, was, there, was there an intentionality to like, uh, what, 
Do you have to do a PR dance for that? Or do you just let the story be what it is and you hope people get that it's going to be its own thing? Or were you worried about a backlash from that when you put that out? Uh, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I don't really worry about that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I would never sleep if that were the case. But uh, I will say that, you know, I've always kind of looked at it like you have to uh, – Eh, I'm not going to really say like train the fans or something, but you just have to be out there saying like this is going to be different and pre be prepared for this. And I think that, you know, I don't want to spoil anything for people that aren't watching it, but uh, Sophie is in the barn. So, uh, you know, things like that, you know, are uh, – Whatever, maybe they've seen it already. I don't know. But uh, uh active spoiler alerts. <laughs> Things like that, uh, you know, do I think I feel like they show the audience like this is going to be different. Prepare for this to be different. And I think that's important. And, you know, one of the coolest things about The Walking Dead is when you sit down to read a comic, you know, you have no idea what's going to happen next. And I want to maintain that in the show, even for the people that have already been reading the comic for a long time so you know i i want there to be differences and i want there to be characters that die way earlier than they do in the comic and characters that live way longer than they did in the comic and you know i think that that will you know make things surprising and compelling you know for the comic book audience which is important to me it's, it's an interesting new space that we live in, in that people enjoy so much of their media uh, asynchronously. So at this point, you've got people who are only familiar with the television show. You've got people like me who will, who will read bursts of the comic books. Like I got all the way caught up in one big run last year, but I've sort of held off for the next time I want to do a burst of the, of the comic book. Do you, uh, do you worry about uh, in casual conversation like spoiling whatever the, the latest of the comic books are or, or just for you it's like, hey, whatever. It's, it's, this is, I'm just going to say words and if it messes up your experience, I'm not going to worry about it. No, I try to maintain things uh, uh, for audiences. I, I, as a fan, I hate spoilers. I really don't like uh, having things ruined for me, and uh, so I, I try not to uh, mess things up in the interviews. Uh, I do uh, joke from time to time when uh, I, I feel like most people are staying up to date on the show that would be watching this, so I don't feel like that uh, would have spoiled too many people. So uh, uh, I'm willing to sacrifice the five or six people who may not have seen that episode for the laughs, you know, because I'm addicted to the laughs. But uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm pretty good at interviews. I try not to spoil anything for the comic because I I do know that, you know, none of those issues have shipped yet. So uh, uh, people don't know that stuff. But uh, I don't know. Spoilers are kind of important to me. Do you uh, – I know in the comic, uh, you know, you respond to a lot of the letters. Do you start to recognize certain names over and over again or do you feel like a personal connection, maybe a – I don't want to say a better connection to people who are into the comic book. But, but surely that being a smaller pool, I would imagine – you you have to feel these are the people you're going to meet at the conventions years before the television show comes out. I, I mean, are they are they your your real babies or or do you just like you love everyone equally? I. I... I definitely love everyone equally. I don't care if you just watch the show and have never read the comic or, you know, uh, hate the show and love the comic or love the show and hate the comic. Like, no, I don't care. Your uh, the people that read the comic. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you, but, uh, uh, no, I mean, just because, you know, I think comic readers are cool and it's an important medium. And so anybody that's going to, you know, take a chance on, you know, discovering something new and reading a comic, it, you know, those are those are definitely cooler people. Uh, so uh, screw those people that just watch TV. But uh, I mean, I, I don't I don't really mean that. I mean, I kind of do, but not really. So you know, Well, you know, the brain is a complex thing. It's you can never mean anything entirely all at one point. Um, <laughs> wow. OK. What? It, our, our show is targeted towards people who want to watch things on the internet for the most part. There's cord cutters out there, but we're also very insistent that you don't break the law to do it. Uh, what, what is your take for, you know, what is your advice? What is your, what is your position for people who are like, look, you know what? I, I don't want to have to get a cable subscription, but I do want to get you your money for making this awesome thing. Uh, you know, what's the best way for me to get your show? Uh, I don't know. I mean, piracy is a whole big thing, and I've got very weird views on it. I mean, I think uh, uh, I shouldn't go into too many things. I'll, I'll get in trouble. But uh, I mean, if you don't want to get cable, uh, buy a Netflix account. You know, The Walking Dead's on Netflix. But uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it's a tough thing. I mean, uh, I, I will admit that, like, I, I'm an HBO subscriber. 
You know, like I, I, I buy HBO, I have cable. Uh, every now and then I miss an episode and I on demand stuff. Sometimes I don't have that set up. And so I'll just torrent an episode. And it's like, am I technically stealing that? Do I subscribe to HBO? I kind of feel like I, I bought that. So whatever. But I mean, sometimes I torrent things. So so I don't know. And I, it's a hard thing. It's like if somebody torrents one episode of The Walking Dead and then goes out and buys a DVD because they liked it, like it's not necessarily the worst thing in the world. So, I mean, it is a weird situation and, you know, people shouldn't steal things. Things, but uh, I know that, you know, it's – I don't know. I think people demonize it a little more than they should. I know that I personally have gotten a lot of readers uh, in the comic book series because they've sampled something through piracy, and I, I don't know. I, mean, I, I, I have mixed feelings. One of the uh, recurring themes of late on this show is the question about what's ethical versus what's legal, and that uh, the two very, very often diverge. They certainly do. <laughs> I was that was the moment that I thought Tom was going to jump in with some kind of witty insight, and it didn't happen. Oh yeah, that 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 question got really smart really quickly, and I just could not hang on. I apologize. Huh? Uh, hey, we have, hey. from, from the chat room, <laughs> Code Monkey X says he wants to know if you were surprised at the level of gore that was allowed to be shown on AMC, or is that something that you knew going into the project? I, I am constantly surprised at the level of gore. I mean, I knew going into the project. I mean, I had seen Breaking Bad, and at the time, someone's uh, foot had just been ground up in a lawnmower uh, on Mad Men. So I knew that AMC was doing gore on television. And one of the really reassuring things that I was told was that, you know, Every now and then there's an episode of Breaking Bad where there's a severed head on a turtle or someone gets sh someone gets shot in the head and you can see through the back of their head and someone's on the other side of their head. So they do like pretty gory stuff. And I was told that there's no limit to how much gore they can do per episode. So if they've done one thing on Breaking Bad, we can do that in Walking Dead every minute of every episode and it would be fine. So technically we could do an episode of The Walking Dead that's viewed entirely through a hole in someone's head and that would – get through their sensors, which is kind of awesome. So I knew going in that we'd be able to get away with a lot of stuff, but I had no idea that we'd be able to get away with all the stuff that we've done. I mean, you know, moving it, moving through season two, I, we've been actively like trying to push the envelope and trying to like keep doing stuff and like finding that thing that AMC will go, eh, no, 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 don't do that. Uh, and we haven't found it yet. So we are going to keep upping the stakes and hopefully we'll eventually find that line because it's very important to me that I know the line. You know, I want to know the, the limit the, the, that we can go to because if we're not, you know, touching that limit constantly, then we're just not doing our jobs, right? So I don't want to be lazy. I want to. I want to put as much guts in this show as possible. Yeah, I re I really enjoy the leftover limb comedy. That's that's one of, <laughs> one of my favorite parts. <laughs> there so will be more. Excellent. There's a lot of uh, aspiring filmmakers and creators of, of new media content here. And in the chat room, somebody asks uh, for a bit of advice for aspiring filmmakers and writers. What was the most difficult thing for you in the Walking Dead series? Uh, the difficult thing, like creatively, like doing, like what? Yeah. what what's uh, that guy I, I, mean? I, I, it me seemed out. like the two questions mashed up as one. What's your advice for aspiring filmmakers or writers? And uh, what was the most difficult thing for you in the Walking Dead series? I guess you could take either one of those. Oh, well, I mean, I, I would say uh, uh, I don't like giving advice because I think I'm kind of a moron. I mean, I'll be honest. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, like uh, if you want to do something, just do it. You know, I think that if you want to be a writer, just write a bunch of stuff. And if you want to be a filmmaker, make a bunch of films. And, you know, because it's the future and everything and the Internet's all awesome and stuff, like you can pretty much get your stuff seen by somebody. And if you're talented, someone will discover you and you'll be able to uh, to to do a good thing and make a living and now my words aren't making sense but like the real key is you know having talent that's that's really the uh, the hard part and you'll generate that talent to a certain extent by doing a lot of work so i would just say to uh, constantly do work all the time like you have nothing else better to do uh if you're serious about it uh so you know that, that's that's always my advice and then the most difficult thing about the walking dead is doing interviews all the time no seriously but do you sacrifice goats or is there a pill or like What's the what's the real formula for success? You sacrifice goats, turn them into pills, and then eat those pills. That's the that's yes! the key. I knew it. Told ya. Right. Told ya. I know. And the interviews are are horrible. We should uh, we we should <laughs> uh, we should mention that you're uh, you're going to be at the Image Comic Expo in Oakland, California this weekend. So anybody who is at who is watching in the in the Bay Area should stop by. And uh, you're, you're going to be there. Are you going to be signing autographs? You're going to be doing panels. What are you going to be doing? 
I'll be doing panels. I'll be doing a lot of panels. I'll be doing a lot of signings. Uh, I'll have a table. I'll sell you a book. Uh, we got a, a very uh, special variant for Walking Dead 94. There's an Image Expo cover that we've done, and there's only 5,000 of those in existence, and we're giving them all away at the Image Expo. So the first 5,000 people through the door get one of those for free, which is kind of cool. And I'll be honest with you, you can probably turn those around on eBay for at least 10 bucks, like on the day and probably like 50 something or something like eventually. So uh, uh, I'd recommend coming and snagging a couple of those. You'd make a good profit. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I'll be high fiving people. I'll be shaking hands. I'll be kissing babies. I'll do whatever you want. I mean, I'm at a Comic Con. <laughs> I just want to make you happy. Robert Kirkman for President of the United States, ladies and gentlemen. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. We know you got other stuff going on, but we're tremendous fans and we, uh, we care a lot about your, your show and your work. And uh, we're very flattered that you could spend time with us. Oh, cool, man. Thanks a lot. It was a lot of fun. I, and, and thanks for the headset. This is great. I'm going to use this all the time now. Yeah, please. You know, you could probably get five bucks for that on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> or sign it. You'll get ten. <laughs> hey <laughs> All right. Thanks again, Robert. Really appreciate you taking the time. Cool. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. That's it for this episode of Framerate. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash FR. Email us, show at gmail.com. We'll see you next time.